The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It has been said by more people than I that the virtuous can walk the straight and narrow path single file, but one can never sin alone. The evildoer is pursued to the ends of the earth by one voice, his conscience. This tale, adapted from the pen of Edith Wharton, reminds us with what hypnotic tongue the voice of conscience can speak. Are you saying that for the past 200 years, the same ghost has been living in this house? Oh, no, Mrs. Morgan. The house has changed hands many times. Many people have lived here. The ghost is always a different ghost. Well, that's a new twist. And the way I figured, Mr. Morgan, it's the people who bring a ghost with them. There's something about this house that always makes a ghost feel welcome. <laughs> mystery drama, The Man in the Black Cap, was adapted from an Edith Wharton classic, especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate, Jr., and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Richard III a king and a murderer, as Shakespeare has drawn him, wrestles one night with his guilt. My conscience, he says, hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in several tales, and every tale condemns me as a villain. Our story of the power of conscience takes place today, yet the crime it discloses is as old as the first sin in the Garden of Eden. I remember so well the day John and I went to look for a house. It was the first day of the fall. The New England trees marching up the road with their red-gold banners of leaves leading us right up the main coast to Eastport Harbor, a delicious little town with its bright white church and velvety village green. We sat in a tiny room of the only real estate agent in town. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Morgan... There ain't so many houses in your price range as there used to be. Folks are getting mighty smart about values these days. And for your top figure, I'm not so sure. Uh, Mr. Higgins, suppose we up the ante to 60000 60? Oh, John, do you think we should? Would that give us a greater selection? Oh, I don't know that it would. You see, folks around here, they ain't so much wanting to sell. Oh, but, Mr. Higgins, doesn't anyone die in this town? Out in Colorado, where we come from... The young people, they don't want to hang on to all the old homesteads when their parents pass on. They're looking for a, a, a new life. They can't sell fast enough and move to the city. Yeah, around here, Mrs. Morgan, people don't die off so fast. And when they do, the young folks like to stay where they was born. Bring up their children here. You mean there's nothing for sale in Eastport Harbor? Nothing at all? Where are you folks staying? Uh, we thought we'd try the inn. That's a nice place, good food. Tell you what, seeing as how you're both so determined, give me a day. I'll call you Wednesday morning at the inn and uh, see what I can come up with. Hey, what's the verdict? How do you like the house? Well, I don't know, really. I uh, have to think it over. Now, I don't want to pressure you, but I got some folks coming up from Augusta tomorrow morning. And they're particularly interested in an honest-to-goodness Victorian house. But you don't want to pressure us. In my line of business, Mr. Higgins, we wouldn't exactly call that a soft sell. And what would your line be, Mr. Morgan? I'm in the mining business, but I'm retired now. (laughs) A young fellow like you, retired already? John sold his mine. It was his idea to come east to live. Oh, John, it's a darling house. It's it's the kind I've always wanted. I uh, think we've been through every room. And that fantastic little square deck on the roof. You can see for miles around. Who ever thought to put it up there? Well, Morgan. Most of these old houses by the ocean have them. They're called a captain's walk, ma'am. hundred years ago, a captain's wife 
could go up there to watch for her husband's ship to come in. Oh, do you hear that, John? It's just the place to write. Oh, I don't know. The kitchen needs a lot of work. That old icebox and the old coal mm, stove. That's going to be my department. I want the kitchen to stay old-fashioned, just the way it is. You're not going to like hauling coal to cook with, I'll tell you that. It takes a little getting used to. Uh, now, how far does the property extend? You said 25 acres? Well, come here to the front door. I'll show you. Now, I'd say just about as far as the eye can see in all directions. To your right, to your left, straight ahead up the hill. Mm. And in back of the house, clear down to the ocean. Oh, I love this garden. And the rambling roses on each side of the gate. I can't wait till spring. Oh, well, it's a nice location. I'll say that. I'm going to put a lot of time into this garden, John, while you're writing your book. Oh, and that clock striking the hour. It's been doing that for over 200 years, Mrs. Morgan. 12 o'clock. Oh, so many pretty sounds. I think I know everything I have to know about this place. And it all makes me absolutely positive I want to live here. Now, there's only one thing about the house I haven't told you folks. Hmm? But uh, seeing as how you're a modern kind of couple, I didn't think it very important. Do you mean the fact that every room needs painting? The ghost. Oh, there's a ghost that lives here? You were right, Mr. Higgins, not to bother us with fairy tales. It's high time people discarded such superstitions. Oh, superstitious, I'm not. I'm not the only real estate agent in Eastport Harbor. I'm also the only sheriff. I didn't know that. You're the sheriff, too? Well, meaning I look at happenings realistically, believe me. At one time, I'd have said the same as you about superstitions. But uh, the ghost who comes around here is different. Oh, how so? I've seen it. Myself. <laughs> Are you a drinking man, Mr. Higgins? Well, no more than I can handle. Why? Well, I thought perhaps you tied one on the night you saw this uh, ghost. It wasn't night. I've seen it by day. And have there always been ghosts here? For 200 years, ma'am. Always the same? Oh, no, no. Always a different ghost. Oh, well, that's a new twist. The way I figure it, it's the people who live here who bring the ghosts with them. Something about this makes ghosts feel welcome. Well, that's the only explanation I can give. John, this is the house I want to live in. Put down my roots. And Eastport Harbor is the town I want to live in. Now, you arrange everything with Mr. Higgins. Those two months, until the cold weather set in, were the happiest of my life. I didn't miss Colorado one bit. I felt as though I... I belonged on this coast of Maine. John started his book on mining, but I, I knew he wasn't as much at home here as I was. He was restless. Sometimes he'd go a whole day without saying a word, or he'd take long walks all by himself. On the whole, everything was peaceful enough, though, until that telephone call. Hello? Hello? Uh, Mrs. Morgan, Hester? Uh, who is this? Uh, this is Hugh Bryant. Uh, Mr. Bryant? Uh, are you calling all the way from Colorado City? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, can I... Is, is John there? Hello? Why, John, is that you? This is Hugh Bryant. Uh, I, I better hang up in the hall extension, Mr. Bryant. I, I guess you and John want to talk. Uh, bye. Bye, Hester. Nice to talk to you. Uh, John, you still on the phone? Uh, yes, I am, Hugh. Uh, Hester, go on. You can hang up now. Why did John cut me off like that? I stood by the telephone for a few minutes. Then suddenly this this awful feeling came over me. The sulfurous smell of danger. I turned around quickly and there was a a shadow of a man on the frosted glass frame around the front door. Then then he was gone. And then something completely Told me to pick up the whole extension again and listen. When did all this happen, Hugh? I heard it this morning. Where does that leave the lawsuit? Well, it still stands, I guess. Unless, unless he dies of the gunshot wound. Well, he's in a coma now. The nasty part is I thought I'd hushed up the whole lawsuit. But now it's going to be in all the papers. I've had three reporters here already with a lot of insinuating questions. Oh, well, what do they say? Nothing very complimentary about you, John. Yes. Well, keep me posted, will you, Hugh? 
I'll send along a clipping or so. And if anything develops on the lawsuit, I'll let you know. Okay. Thanks for calling, Hugh. Come in, Hester. You don't usually have the study door closed, John. I disturb easily when I'm writing. I <clears throat> don't know what persuaded me I could write a book about copper mining. You're an engineer and you own the mine. What else do you need? I suspect I need to know how to write. <laughs> Just to put down my experiences. It... <sighs> well, it isn't coming out the way I thought it would. Maybe you should do something else, John. Well, that's just the trouble. We have a bank full of money from selling the lucky penny mine, but I don't know what I want to do with myself. <laughs> Forty years old, and like Higgins said, a little young to be retired. Um, what did Hugh Bryant want? Oh, uh, nothing really. Tying up some loose ends from the sale of the mine, that's all. Really? Is that all? Why do you say that? If I say that's all, that is all. John... You never used that tone of voice to me before. What did you come busting here for anyway? You know I'm working. Questions, questions. Well, if you must know, I came because I was frightened. Oh? No. There, there was someone at the door. Well, I didn't hear the bell ring. He just stood there, and suddenly he he vanished. It scared me. Oh, come on now. He probably came to the wrong house. He thought better of it and left. I don't know. I, I'm still a little shook up. John, John, would you do me a favor? Oh, sure, sure, sure I will. Oh, Hester, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I, I'm I'm sorry I barked at you just now. What is it? Would you come upstairs with me to the captain's walk? Now? Now. Oh, sure. But why? Well, I, I can't explain it. It's a beautiful view, and maybe a little change for you will help get rid of your cobwebs or whatever it is that's keeping you from concentrating. <laughs> a little nippy up here. Mm. <laughs> you really can see for miles, huh? Let's, let's just stay up here until the sun sets, all right? Okay, but it's turning mm. chilly. John, do you know what day it is? Today. Uh, oh, it's November the 1st, mm. isn't it? Is it anything else? Uh, Saturday. Well, it is Saturday, isn't it? John, mm. are you really happy in this house? Oh, you're really full of questions today, aren't you? Hey, look down there. Mm. You see that big boat cutting across the channel? Mm -hmm. That's an old four-master. Must be a chartered schooner. You can change the subject all you want, John. But I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. It's this house, John. You're not the same John Morgan I married ten years ago. Today. Oh, so mm -hmm. that's it. Ha -ha, I've forgotten our anniversary. Oh, Hester, I am sorry. We're not as close as we were, John. I know it, and you know it. John, it's not something to push under a rug. What is it that's troubling you? Well, it must be because I'm at a crossroads in my life or something. I'm not sure what I want to do. When I bought the Lucky Penny and ran it, I, I was sure that that would be my life. Then when I sold it, I thought, well, I'll come east and write. Get away from the mining business. John, don't look down there. That, that man opening our gate and walking up the path. Do you see him? Yes. Yes, I see him. John, that's the man who came to the front door. He, he's got the same kind of peak cap on. Yeah, I'll be right back. John, John, where are you going? John, come back. Who is this stranger who has turned up twice at the door? Is he real? An apparition? Surely not the ghost Mr. Higgins warned him about. Let's stop guessing, shall we? I suspect we'll know more when I return shortly with Act Two. Let me reset the scene for you. It is November. In a large old house, Right on the main coast dwell a husband and wife recently transplanted from the Midwest, where the husband has made what in commercial circles would be called a killing. Are we being overly suspicious if we wonder whether the killing was purely business? John? Darling, where are you? Oh, you frightened me. What's the matter with you, Hester? You open a door, I happen to be standing right behind it. Oh, what are you doing? I just got up from my desk to find a book. What should I be doing? I'm trying to write. What about that man? What man? Five minutes ago, you left me on the roof. 
I had to climb down that rickety ladder all by myself. Now, what about the man we saw coming in the gate? The man I'd seen before when you were on the phone. Oh, yeah. Uh, nothing, nobody. I, I thought it was old Higgins, so I ran down to ask him about the deed. I haven't received a certified copy yet. You thought the man we saw was Mr. Higgins? Oh, whoever it was, when I opened the door, was gone. How could that be? I was looking right down from the captain's walk. I didn't see anyone go away. I can't help what you saw or didn't see. He'd gone, I tell you, and no one was there. Uh, I can't imagine why you thought it was Mr. Higgins. This was a much younger man. Please stop playing me, Hester, and go away. Sometimes you can be very exasperating. When John's in one of those moods, it's best to leave him alone. And those moods are becoming more and more frequent. His temper's getting shorter and shorter. Then, something caught my eye on the hallway floor. I bent down and picked up an empty shotgun shell. How did it get here? We don't have a gun in the house. Why make such a fuss about an empty shotgun shell? Look, since we've moved in, I've cleaned every inch of this house. And, John, there wasn't any shotgun shell that could have escaped me. Uh, here, let me have it. Oh, now, will you look at it, honey? Who knows how long it's been lying around? Could have been kicked in the door by someone walking in. There are a thousand rational explanations. Look, my dad and I used to go hunting in the lake country, and I fired hundreds of rounds of those things. If it was fired more than two days ago, I'll eat it. Hester, look, why are you getting on my nerves like this? Will you tell me why I am? We'll be hurting each other soon, Hester, if we go on this way. I agree. We're not used to being under each other's feet 24 hours a day. In Colorado, you were always at the mine or in town. I had my work, my life. Here, we're, we're too much alone. Well, I hope to heaven that's all it is. So do I. That's why I've invited old Mr. Higgins to stop by this afternoon for tea or a drink. Maybe he'll be the breath of fresh air we need. Some more tea, Mr. Higgins? May I fill your cup? Why, no thanks, Mrs. Morgan. I think I'd better be on my way before the fog drifts further inland. Mm. It's nice of you two to invite me over. You know, whenever I hear that foghorn, I think of some captain's wife up on our roof waiting for her husband's ship to come in. That's just what they used to do, Mom. Uh, Mr. Higgins, you remember the day we first came to see you last September? You said you had another party interested in buying this house? Yeah, I do. Do you think we could get our money back if we put the house on the market? Yeah. You heard me, Hester. Put the house on the market. Well, now, I'm sorry it doesn't suit you. It uh, wouldn't be a little old ghost, would it? Ghost? What ghost? Well, maybe a new one showed up. I thought you said the people who live here attract their own ghosts. If this is a joke, you two, I'm not laughing. Here's uh... Isn't that someone in the front door? Yes, I'll go. And uh, if you're not here when I get back, Mr. Higgins, remember what I said. Ask around. See what kind of money you can get for this place. John. I'll be back when I'm back. Well, now, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset Mr. Morgan with that talk about a ghost. I didn't think he'd take it so hard. I don't know what to make of him. Sell the house? He's never said that before. You have uh, many visitors. Well, except for you, we don't know anybody yet in Eastport Harbor. I know what you're thinking. Who was at the door? You're very perceptive. Well, it's the second time today. This morning, the same thing happened. John just got up, walked out of the house, and never said a thing. If you like, ma'am, maybe I could have a talk with him, man to man. And, maybe uh, could... I'd be happy to talk to you, Mr. Higgins. Uh, let's take a walk right now. Huh? You're not going to go out like that, are you? It's very cold. Mr. Higgins, shall we go? Why, sure. Now's as good a time as any. Mrs. Morgan, thanks again for the tea. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Mrs. Higgins will want you both to come visit us. <laughs> okay, neighbor. Let's be off before it gets so foggy. We can't see our feet. Oh, and, and take your red Christmas scarf, darling. You know how easily you catch cold. Yes, 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 I will. Oh, and you won't be long, will you? That foghorn's such a lonely sound. It gives me the woolies knowing you're out somewhere in it. It, it scares me. Hester, darling, what are you talking about? We're going to stay here. You know we both love it. Fog or no fog. It was all part of John's strangeness. His sudden turnabout from wanting to get rid of the house to saying he loved it here. 
I went into his study and had a long look. It got later and later, so I went up to the captain's walk to wait for him. Esther! Esther, where are you? I'm coming down, John. I was beginning to worry. I- I've had a stew ready since six, and it's after eight. Uh, tell Mr. Higgins to leave his coat in the hall if he wants to come in. Uh, I'll set another place. Mr. Higgins isn't here. But didn't he come up the road with you? If you don't mind, Hester, I'll skip dinner. I'm not very hungry. Not hungry after a four-hour walk? What, what is it's it? It's nothing, it's nothing. I'm going to my study to John. work. John! John, what, what's the trouble? I, I've, I've got to know. Uh, would you mind, Hester, very much closing the door to my study on the outside? I have lots to do. Like writing Elliot Harmon's name practically over every page? What were you doing in here? Did something go wrong with the lucky penny we sold Elliot? I want to know. No, nothing, nothing. I want to know, too, why you didn't bring Mr. Higgins back with you for dinner since you and he were out together that long. Higgins left me hours ago. I walked up the hill, and he took the right fork back to town. But I saw you. I was on the captain's walk waiting. A half an hour ago, you were walking this way with him. You're mad. (laughs) That wasn't me you saw. Probably two other people (laughs) in this fog. How could you tell? Because one of the men was wearing your red scarf. It was you, John. I know it. You were talking to someone. Now, don't say anything, please. If you were hiding things from me, you... You probably have a good reason. The battle lines had been drawn. We were no longer two people joined by one marriage. He locked himself into a study. And for the next few hours, I was engulfed by a sense of of dread. Finally, I went to bed and tried to go to sleep. awake. There was something heavy in the air. John Morgan, you cheated me. What? Who's there? John. John, what is it? Is it a nightmare? And I will die, John Morgan. Oh, no. Before I could stop him, John was out of the bed and running out of his room. I switched on the light. John? John, where are you? I ran about the house like a crazy person. I couldn't find him. I ran back to the bedroom, slipped on some dungarees and a shirt. And then it came to me. He'd gone up to the captain's walk. I climbed up the rickety ladder, opened the little trap door. No, no, it's not true. I told you that a thousand times. I said I'd fix everything, didn't I? Give give, give me time. That's all I ask. Look, I never knew. Why do you keep coming after me? It wasn't my fault. I had nothing to do with it. You've got to believe me. No. No, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't hurt her. She, she, She knows nothing. Don't do it. Come back here. Come back. Come back. John! Don't climb over the railing! John! How is your husband this morning? I can't believe it. He leads a charmed life. Nothing broken after he fell off the roof? Well, as I told you on the phone, I ran downstairs. He picked himself up. He didn't say a word. He just went to bed. What was he doing on the roof in the middle of the night, anyway? I wish I could tell you. But it's so incredible. Nobody would believe me. No one would ever believe what? Oh, good morning, Higgins. What brings you here? Oh, Miss Morgan, I heard you had a little trouble last night. Fell or slipped or something. You wouldn't like to have someone look at you? I know you mean to be neighborly, Higgins, but you understand I've got to get to my study and work. Uh, Bring me some coffee, will you, Hester? I guess I'd better go. Mr. Higgins... If I told you something, could you... Could you keep it to yourself? Hester, I said coffee, please. I'll go now, Mrs. Morgan. And if there's some way I can help, please phone me. I don't know if you can. I don't know if anyone can. Here's your coffee, John. Oh, 
Thanks, sir. Just leave it on the table, huh? No, last night, when you were up there on the captain's walk, who were you talking to, John? Hmm? What? John, don't shut me out. Tell me what's troubling you. Hester, look, believe me, uh, look, I, I, I can't, Hester. I, I want to, but I can't. It's been months of this waiting and just... Oh, what's that you've got in your hand? The mail? One letter. It, it just came. So, you won't tell me. Uh, let me have it, will you? Don't grab it out of my hand. It's addressed to both of us. Thank you for the coffee, Hester. Thank you for the mail. Well, aren't you going to open it? Later, when I've had my coffee. Oh, it, it's from Hugh Bryant in Colorado City. And I'd like to know what it says. Now, would you mind... Now, what's that? I'll get to it. Would you give it back? I'm opening this letter right now, and I'm reading no, it. No, you're not. John, will you get away from you come me? here? Oh! I'll hit you much harder the next time you don't do as I say. It isn't often a man loses so much control that he attacks his wife. I can hear you say once is too often, and I agree. Have we here a man so plagued by guilt, so pursued by the echo of conscience, that he is driven to acts he would never condone in others? I think we shall discover the answers when I return shortly with Act Three. It takes love, courage, and restraint to withstand a slap in the face from your own husband. Hester Morgan possesses all three. But I think you'll agree that there's more to this than moods and acts bordering on the irrational. Obviously... A good and quiet conscience, a peace above all earthly dignities, as Shakespeare has defined it, is not John Morgan's frame of mind. All right. All right, open the letter. Go on. I will. Oh, but th th there isn't a letter. Just this. A newspaper clipping. Oh, what is it? Well, how should I know? Read it. Um, lucky penny fraud. John, did you know about this? Well, what does it mean? Is it a, a lawsuit? I don't know. It's nothing, nothing. Mr. Bryant sent it to us. Look, it's cut out from the Colorado City Times. Is it true what it says? Elliot Harmon is suing us for defrauding him in the sale of the lucky penny. Oh, it doesn't mean a thing. He bought the mine as is. He had tests made. There was no pig in the poke. But, but why is he suing us, then? What for? He is suing the wrong party. Who knew the government would suddenly step in and stop all strip mining? Well, huh? Is that what happened? He took his chances like all of us do. Who, who knew such a thing would happen? So he sues me. Anyway, that's all past. Past? Well, look at the date on the clipping. It was months ago. In fact, uh, the day we left Colorado. It's all over anyway. You mean he, he lost the case? No, no, no. It never came up in court. Was it true, John? Did you cheat him? Was it a fraud? I've got to know. He withdrew the case, I told you. But I want to know why. He... He had an accident, that's why. How do you know? Because you phoned me from Colorado and told me. What kind of an accident? He shot himself. Oh, no. His poor wife. I, I wish I'd known him. Oh, no. Why are you going on like this? It's nothing to do with us. I, I remember his wife, Sarah. She was such a lovely girl. Well, when did he die? He's, he's not dead. At least not so far as I know. I can't believe anything you say. I'm going to telephone Mr. Bryant myself and find out. You'll do no such thing. Oh, yes, I will. The lucky penny was in both our names. I want to know what happened to that poor man. Put that phone down. I'm warning you, Hester, don't force me... Uh, never mind, operator. I won't be making that call. Winter came and went. I wrote some poetry and cried to myself. Spring poked up its crocuses and the trees their buds. John and I remained apart. I never called Hugh Bryant. What was the point in hammering another nail into the coffin of our marriage? And then, one morning, I was on my knees in the garden, putting in some glads and dahlias. It was noon. I beg your pardon. Oh, I, I didn't see you coming in the gate. I'd like to see Mr. Morgan. My husband? I suppose so. I, I haven't had the pleasure. I'm Mrs. Morgan. 
Look, I- I'm afraid, if you don't mind, you'll have to come back after four o'clock. You see, my husband has a strict schedule. He works every day at his book. He won't see anyone until four. I think he's expecting me. Oh, that could be. He doesn't always tell me everything. Haven't you been to see him before? I get the feeling somehow that... Oh, oh pay no attention to me. Sometimes I... I think I know people from somewhere, and it's just my imagination. So, he's expecting you. I'm sure of it. You've come from pretty far, haven't you? <laughs> pretty far? Uh, no one wears a cap like that. Oh, forgive me, I, I didn't mean to be rude. May I see Mr. Morgan? Well, I, I'm sure he won't mind, even though it's just 12. The front door's open. He, he's right at the back. The last room's his study. I, I'd show you the way, but I, I, I must get these bulbs in now that the weather's turned. Thank you very much, Mrs. Morgan. Those were the last words I ever heard our visitor say. That strange man wearing a black cap which shaded his eyes so much I never saw them. I went round the back to catch the last of the gladiola bulbs. It was one o'clock when I went into the house. John wasn't there. Oh, Mrs. Morgan. I got your message when I got home. My wife said you'd call. Sorry I didn't get back to you before. We're just finishing dinner. Mr. Higgins, have you seen John? Why, is something the matter? I don't know. He's been gone all day, and I, I wondered if you'd seen him in town or anything. Well, I wasn't in East Port Harbor today. Uh, tell you what, if Mr. Morgan doesn't get back by, oh, say, 11 or 12 tonight, you call me. May I? And if I don't hear from you... I know he's home, safe and sound. Hello? Yes? Mr. Higgins, it's midnight, and John isn't back yet. Okay, Mrs. Morgan, you just sit tight. I'll be right over. Now, first thing in the morning, Mrs. Morgan, I'll get a parcel of volunteers together, and we'll search the whole area. But you're sure, ma'am, he didn't leave some message for you? I looked everywhere, in his study, on his desk. It it was just like he got up and walked out the door. And when was the last time you saw him, uh, Mrs. Morgan? Oh, about breakfast time, I brought him some coffee. Not anywhere since, going out the door or up the hill? No, the man who came to see him, he must have. Oh, what man? A young man. He said John was expecting him. So I sent him along inside, and I went about putting in my flowers. Then, about one o'clock, I went in to make lunch, and and John was gone. Uh Uh-huh. And his visitor? They were both gone. Would you remember what he looked like, the the young man? I think so. Uh, Wasn't anything funny about him? I mean, I mean, he was real flesh and blood, as they say. Well, it never occurred to me that he was a... Oh. Oh, that's not... Possible, is it, Mr. Higgins? Not, not real? Well, I hope not. I guess not. And, and then there's this telegram that came for John yesterday from uh, Mr. Bryant, a lawyer in Colorado City. Here, I, I'll, I'll read it to you. Need you personally to sign documents relating to Lucky Penny. Bryant. Uh, Lucky Penny? It should be called Unlucky Penny. It's been nothing but bad luck to everyone who's picked it up. Hello, Mr. Bryant. Why, Hester, uh, I should say welcome back to Colorado City. But uh, what I am going to say is, don't you people believe in answering telegrams? Now, three weeks ago, I needed to file these papers. I telephoned you, no one's at home, and... Well, anyways, I'm glad to see you. Where's John? Mr. Bryant, I came alone. Oh, no, that's awkward. Is he in town with you? No. Well, it's John I ought to have to sign these papers. I guess you can. Uh, why is he? That's just it. I don't know. He, He's disappeared. He what? Yes. Yes, he's gone. Three weeks ago. They can't find him. Nobody knows anything. They, they've gone through the woods with dogs. They... They had helicopters everywhere. He's 
He's gone. Oh, that sure is distressing news. <laughs> but you mustn't give up hope, Hester. I, I don't know what to think anymore, but I have to do something. Well, forget the business, huh? I don't know whether you know it, Hester, but after Elliot Harmon bought the lucky penny, he brought a lawsuit against John. Oh, yes, John told me. Well, of course, we take the opposite view. Harmon sued on the grounds that John had misrepresented the mine's ability to continue to function. Of course, that was patently nonsense. No one could know the government would suddenly close down all strip mining. Well, at any rate, Elliot Harmon became despondent and shot himself. Oh. The bullet lodged in him. It took months before he he finally died. When when was that? Three weeks ago today, as a matter of fact. At what time? Well, that's a funny question, has it? No, Mr. Bryant, I, I, I've got to know. Two o'clock, our time. Well, what would that be in Maine? By, uh, noon, 12 noon. I knew it. I felt it all along. Lord in heaven. You knew what, Esther? John isn't missing. He's dead. They killed him. He's been murdered. Don't you see? Elliot Harmon dies. Within an hour, John disappears. Are you saying that someone actually killed John as a revenge for Elliot Harmon? Uh, yes, I am. But how could there be any connection? We're thousands of miles apart. Couldn't someone in Colorado City have telephoned to Eastport Harbor to go out and, and get John? Oh, that's awfully far-fetched. We sold the lucky penny for a good price, right? Now, if Elliot and Sarah Harmon felt they were cheated, so did all those other people who put up their money. At 12 o'clock, see, I remember hearing our church bell ringing the time. At 12, a young man came to our gate and asked to see John. I sent him inside. I never saw him or my husband again. Well, now, this young man, could you describe him? You remember him? I told the police everything I knew. The only distinguishing thing about him was he, he wore a, a black cap. Did you see a black cap? Yes. I never saw his eyes. They were like deep hollows, all shaded by that cap. Well, that's hard to believe. What is? Uh, oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, uh, hello, Chief Foster. I was going to call you. Yes, I have Mrs. Morgan with me. Hester Morgan, you remember her? She came up from the east on business. It uh, seems there's quite a mystery about John Morgan. He disappeared three weeks ago. Uh, what? Well, you don't mean it. Well, that's a terrible thing. Yes, yeah, certainly I'll ask her, and if she agrees, we'll be right along. Thanks, Chief. It, um... Uh, it seems that John isn't the only one who disappeared. Mm -hmm. Sarah Harmon visited her cemetery yesterday, first time in weeks. Her husband's grave had been dug up. His body is gone. Oh, no. They think they have a clue over at the Lucky Penny, and I told the chief you were here. I have to go, but if you want to, you can come along, Hester. It'll seem strange to go there now, but why not? When we arrived at the Lucky Penny, they dug an experimental shaft to locate new deposits crowd of rescue workers stood around it. They found something at the bottom. Finally, they brought up two bodies. One was John's. John, my husband. The other, they said, was Elliot Harmon. He had a black cap on his head. I recognized him as the young man who had come to see John three weeks ago. Is it beyond our comprehension to grasp what we have just enacted? That a man on the edge of death could haunt the one responsible until death itself does arrive and claims them both? We know so little of the world beyond. Isn't it possible that our flights of fancy could be on the wings of truth? I shall return shortly 
Now a word for working sticks. If you keep your noses to the grindstone, your nose is gonna be a mess. Ooh. So stick your nose into your TV set and have a laugh on TVS. Hello, neighbor, we're in labor. Whoops, we meant to say we're working stiffs. But when we take a job, we mess it up. More laughs than you can shake a slapstick at when we CBS it up. Watch Working Stiffs clean up this fall on CBS television. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Bicozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Bicozine actually speeds healing. Bicozine Cream. What a relief. For constipation, remember X-Lax Pills, the overnight wonder. X-Lax Pills, the overnight wonder. X-Lax Pills, for occasional use only as directed. I'm Susan Anton. It's a good feeling to sleep the night away on a perfect sleeper bicycle. Pillow Soft is the ultimate in sleep. Unique exquisite cushioning for heavenly comfort on top. Ultra firm support inside. Perfect sleeper pillow soft. Firmness that feels good. Be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect sleeper. Perfect sleeper bicycle. Show me that. I love to shop. I'm a woman. I love to travel. I work. I always need something. A new wardrobe. Leather luggage. A gift for him. A gift for me. What do you do? Show him your clout. Hey, we're in charge with Master Charge. When you carry Master Charge, you carry clout. Show me clout. Consider the phrase, mind over matter. Is it a rule to live by? Can it remove one man from his writing table and another from his grave? Mind over matter. We find the precept, but not the proof. In Shakespeare, the good book, the Koran, and spoken by hundreds of poets, so it could very well be a fact. And may I add that if our mystery drama has told us anything today, it is also that reward and revenge are not that far apart. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Carol Titel, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.